All right, everybody. Hey, welcome here to uh, the Dr. Axe Show. Hey, we're here. Uh, I know we've got people listening on podcasts and on Facebook Live right now. I just want to say, hey, welcome to the show. I've got a great natural health expert here today, Dr. Dale Bresden. He's the author of this new and awesome book uh, that uh, I was actually checking out here the past couple weeks called The End of Alzheimer's. Now, this is a book that's been on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks in a row right now, and for good reason. He really goes into natural ways to compare at uh, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, a number of other conditions, dementia-related, and really goes through how to boost your brain health using food as medicine, natural supplements and treatments. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Bresden, hey, really honored to have you on the show today. Thanks for coming on. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Axe. I really appreciate it. So I, so I know you're from, uh, you're from California. And you've been in the field for a long time. You've taken care of, you know, a lot of, you know, worked with a lot of patients, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of colleges like UCLA and, and doing research as well. And that's one of the things I really respect about your book is it's so well documented in terms of the research. Tell me a little bit about maybe some things we're going to learn today uh, about, you know, how to end Alzheimer's, as you say in your book. Yeah, it's a really good point. So we, as you said, been doing research in the lab. We've had the lab up for 28 years now, um, and we've been studying the basic mechanisms of neurodegeneration. So the whole idea way almost three decades ago when I started the lab was could we look at neurodegeneration in a fundamental enough way that we could make the first effective treatments for Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative conditions. So that was the idea. And the surprise was we thought, you know, 28 years ago, we were going to come across one molecule that was going to be one medicine. It was going to be one drug. And we didn't realize my wife, who's a family practitioner and integrative physician, told me, whatever you guys find, it's going to have something to do with diet, exercise, sleep, stress, things like that. And I said, no, no, no. So, of course, I should have listened to her all those years ago. And so what we found was that there is a beautiful network that controls you are literally going to build up synapses, make new memories, or whether you're going to tear them down. And what we see as Alzheimer's is when you're on the wrong side of that balance. And as you indicated, it has to do with everything, all these different things. It has to do with what you're eating. It has to do with, did you get enough sleep? It has to do with, are you insulin resistant? So the key here is that we want to know a larger data set. We want to know what is your HSCRP. We want to know what is your C4A. If you have your innate immune system activated, you are increasing your risk for Alzheimer's. So the very processes we call Alzheimer's are related to the very things that you study, the very things that you teach, the very things that are on your website about insulin resistance, about inflammation, about sugar, about hormonal balance, about microbiomes. These things all play into Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. You know, Dr. Uh, Dale, one of the things I'd love for you to talk about as well, you know, we've got a lot of viewers here. Some of them are really young and they haven't even, you know, necessarily thought about, you know, the potential of, of, of how prevalent dementia is today. But again, I, I know my, myself, you know, maybe somebody has, you know, their parents or they themselves who are, are very aware. How many people today are affected with some form of dementia? How much has it grown over the past 20 to 30 years? This is a really good point. It is growing. It's unfortunately, it is increasing. And the number that's typically given is that there are 5.4 million Americans who already have Alzheimer's. But the thing is, that's actually misleading because most people, of course, like you, too young to know that you might get it. So what you really want to know is out of the 320 million currently living Americans, how many of us will develop Alzheimer's during our lifetime? And the answer is about 45 million of us. It's staggering. Wow. And in fact, it's now the third leading cause of death in the United States. And in fact, dementia is now the number one cause of death in the UK. Uh, it has passed cardiovascular disease and cancer as the number one cause of death. So this is a huge and growing problem. And in fact, of course, we are doing things to give it to ourselves so that we need to understand these and we need to have what we call a cognoscopy in the book and a way to evaluate a person to tell. And you indicated the youth movement, which is a really good point. There actually is a group now called YMAA, 
youth movement against Alzheimer's, recognizing that in fact this disease, just like type two diabetes, just like obesity, insulin resistance, these are chronic complex illnesses that start many years before symptoms. Yeah, the, you know, it, it's one of those things, and, and this this happens quite often. Is that when we're young, you know, we don't realize that what we are putting ourselves at risk for. So, so let me ask this: I'd love to dive right in and talk a little bit about the diet surrounding, and 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 how, how this a specific diet can really benefit the brain and dementia. And one other thing I want to point out: you know, I know years ago, this was quite a, quite a long time ago. I read a a, a, um, a researcher was was uh, he actually started mentioning that. Uh, he believed that Alzheimer's was in part type 3 diabetes and really referencing it, that it is such an insulin uh, driven through insulin resistance and insulin issues. Talk a little bit about insulin and then what are some of the foods that you believe are great to start consuming and some foods that people absolutely need to get out of their diet in order to, you know, to, to prevent right. dementia? Yeah, great point. And what, one of the things we found in the lab is, in fact, that what we call Alzheimer's acts actually a protective response, not a destructive. It's a protective response against three fundamentally different insults. And one of them is related to type 3 diabetes. And that's not the whole thing, but it is part of it. So you're right. And in fact, one of the studies using these neural exosomes, these are tiny fragments of brain cells that actually break off and circulate in the blood. It's kind of an amazing story. And what was found by Dr. Getzel here at UCSF is that, in fact, 100% of people who have Alzheimer's disease have central insulin resistance. Whether or not they have it peripherally, they have it in their brains. So in fact, what we found is actually, and again, I, I was shocked to see how critical diet is, both on the negative side impacting this disease and on the positive side to make people better. And so what we found is that the best thing is to have a ketogenic, so it's mild ketogenesis. You want to drive yourself into between 0.5 millimolar and 4 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. And as you know, you can get a ketone meter very inexpensively, easy to do. So we recommend that people do that. The nutrition, the approach that we suggest is called KetoFlex 12-3, and I describe that in the book. So the idea is you want to have a 12-hour fast in between finishing your dinner and starting your breakfast or brunch. You want to have a three-hour fast in between finishing your dinner and bed. And then you want to have ketogenesis, again, a mild ketogenesis, so very low carbohydrates, high good fats diet, much as you've described, and Dr. Mark Hyman has described, and, and David Perlmutter and others. Um, and then it's flexitarian, so it's keto flex. It's flexitarian because if you like to eat meat, if you like to eat uh, fish, that's fine. If you like to be a vegetarian, that's fine too. In either case, you want to be careful. If you're going to be having meat, of course, you want to have small amounts. Meat is a condiment, as they say. Um, and you want to use grass-fed beef. If you're going to have a small amount of beef, that's fine. You want to use uh, pastured eggs, uh, chicken, same thing, organic and pastured. And then for fish, of course, wild fish. And you want to, if, if, if possible, you want to have the smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, uh, sardines, and herring. Yeah, you know, as you know, you want to stay away from things like uh, large mouth. We've had a number of people, by the way, who, who have come in, PET scan proven Alzheimer's disease and have turned out that the major contributor was very high mercury levels. In fact, one guy who, who got this, got it, he had, he had gotten very successful in business and he started having tuna sushi almost every day. And it turned out he had extremely high mercury levels um, and went in and had a PET scan and before this was realized. And when we, uh, when we realized that, in fact, this was mainly mercury, um, he's actually done very well. Wow. I mean, just, you know, it's, you know, it's incredible to think um, how much making even a simple change for some people can do. I mean, a lot of times, I know, again, as you're saying, 20, 30 years ago, we thought diet may have a little to do with it. Now we're seeing it has so much to do with it. And I know this is one of the great things in your book. And for anyone watching, if you yourself want to learn more about this, and especially if you have a loved one or a family member who needs to know this, Get this book, and the thing about um, the end of Alzheimer's, this book is sold all over the place. In fact, it's even in Costco right now, um, Barnes & Noble, it's on Amazon, it's all in, in bookstores nationwide, New York Times bestseller list for five weeks now, the end of Alzheimer's. Forward here by our good mutual friend here, Dr. David Perlmutter, a good buddy of ours. And, uh, again, the thing also I like about this book is you go through – I was 
when I was going through it, this is one of the pages I love the most is when you were going through and actually laying out these charts for people going through very specifically, you know, the diet for people to follow, going through the ideal meals, going through the supplements, a daily regimented supplement plan. This book is so helpful. So check it out. The end of Alzheimer's great book there. So let's dive into supplements and talk about those for a minute with somebody with cognitive decline and some of these issues. What would you say, or maybe your top five or so supplements that you really think could be game changing in a way? Yeah, good point, Josh. So, so the thing is, first of all, I should say dementia should be a rare disease. This should not be common the way it is. This should be a rare problem. And the key here is we don't suggest that everybody take everything, of course. The idea here is to look specifically at what it is that is actually causing the problem. So when you actually look at these at a larger data set of blood tests, you can see which are critical. But in general, so number one, uh, MCT oil turns out to be very helpful because, as you know, it helps to drive you into the ketotic state, the very thing that you need. Your brain, when you have cognitive decline, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's pre-Alzheimer's, typically does not do well with glucose. And of course, when you've got insulin resistance, that's a bigger problem because now the glucose is not having its effect anyway. So you need to drive yourself into, into ketosis. And MCT oil, definitely, uh, absolutely helpful. The second thing is most people, as you know, if you wear clothes or you live indoors, you're likely to be suboptimal in your vitamin D. And many of us are suboptimal in our vitamin D, as you know. So we like to drive people to between 50 and 80 nanograms per mil. I think that's pretty common these days. Um, whereas a lot of people will tell you, no, you know, 20, 25 is enough. It's not optimal. It may be okay it's not optimal. So what we tell people is, look, you, you are now going to be treated like a competitive athlete. So we want to optimize. We don't just want to get you at the low end of normal. So that's the second thing. Vitamin D is a critical one. And then the third thing is there's something called whole coffee fruit extract, as you know, which increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, as does exercise, of course. And exercise increases it by about 10, 12, 13% or so. Whole coffee fruit extract does far better than that. So we often recommend for people, and again, especially if they've now decreased their inflammation, we recommend that people to at least a couple of months of whole coffee fruit extract, which increases BDNF and again, supports the very synapses that we are trying to support to get you back the ability for optimal memory. Um, and then the fourth one is actually if you have an increase in HSCRP, which many people do. So if your HSCRP is over one, if your C-reactive protein is indicating that you have some inflammation, then the using specialized pro-resolving mediators, and you can get this as, for example, SPM active. Um, this is something that, as you know, Dr. Sirhan from Harvard has shown is critical for resolving. Before you think about an anti-inflammatory, you really want to resolve the ongoing inflammation. So it's critical to do that, and we usually tell people do that for a month, then make sure that the inflammation resolved, then you want to be on the omega-3s and things like that. And again, find out what's causing the inflammation. Um, and then there are a couple others, but I would say one of the more important ones is if you, again, if your magnesium is low, magnesium 3 and 8, a very, very common problem. As you know, most of us are deficient in zinc. Most of us are deficient in magnesium. Yeah. Most of us are deficient in iodine. So if any of those, make sure to, again, optimize, not just normalize, but optimize those. Yeah, the, the, great, great advice here. And all, all of these things, you know, co coffee fruit extract is something I'm very familiar with that we've used in supplements before myself and Jordan Rubin who formulate. You know, one of the other things I had questions in terms of supplements is, you know, I, I'm a, I've studied a lot of ancient and Ayurvedic medicine. And I, one of the things I loved about your book is your recommendations and some of the herbal extracts and sort of those ancient superfoods like lion's mane mushroom and ashwagandha. Talk about those two specifically and maybe a few other herbs and how they really can support, you know, s support the body as well. It's a really good point. You know, one of the things we described there and, and we discovered and published actually a few years ago was the subtypes of Alzheimer's disease. You can actually see an inflammatory subtype and a glycotoxic subtype and an atrophic subtype. And guess what? 
The Ayurvedic physicians recognized this thousands of years ago. So they described a subtype of dementia. Of course, they didn't call it Alzheimer's disease, but they, uh, they described a subtype of dementia, for example, that was vata, that was dry, that was our, what we call atrophic type. So in fact, you're absolutely right. And they realized years ago that in fact, ashwagandha turns out to be very helpful. And now we're starting to see molecular mechanisms for each of these. So in fact, ashwagandha actually causes cells to produce, actually have to remove amyloid. So in fact, there are wow. trials going with ashwagandha, with lion's mane. But again, the problem is people tend to do the trials with a single approach. They don't realize this is a concert. This is functional medicine. You need to get the whole thing uh, together to have a big impact. And that's when we see these unprecedented improvements, which we've been seeing for several years now. So ashwagandha, bacopa, as you know, bacopa monieri, uh, again, another one which has an impact on memory, a very striking. Go to cola, another one, especially go to cola for people who are having trouble with focusing. Mm. Very, very helpful. And then, of course, if people are overstressed, rhodiola can be very helpful. You mentioned the lion's mane. So lion's mane actually increases the amount of nerve growth factor produced by the brain. So in fact, again, looking at the molecular details of the process allows you to go in with these different pieces and actually optimize the cognition. I love it. it, it, it it's, uh, you know, one of the things in my study of Chinese medicine, they talk about lion's mane. And, it, you know, when you look at a lion's mane mushroom, it looks like a mop. You know, it looks very funny yeah. looking. It's got these little tendrils coming off of it. But in Chinese medicine, they believed, you know, when a food looked like a certain organ, it actually maybe supported that organ. So if you look at like a reishi mushroom, it looks almost identical to a kidney in your adrenals. Yeah. And lion's mane, they would say in Chinese medicine, it helps support the gut-brain connection and... Anyway, it's a, it's a supplement that I, I've taken frequently over the years. You know, one of the fastest growing supplements today, especially in the state of California, is CBD oil. Have you guys looked into CBD at all or, or any thoughts on that in regards to, to Alzheimer's? Absolutely. And in fact, the receptors uh, are associated with cognition. And so what we tend to suggest is for people who are having trouble sleeping, especially people who are a little anxious, people who are... Uh, having trouble with the overall amount of sleep or having trouble falling asleep, um, we recommend some CBD oil. For people who aren't, it's up to them. You know, that's one of the ones that's optional, but a good point. And you mentioned the gut-brain axis a minute ago. This is, as you know, a huge, huge issue. And many people who have the chronic inflammation associated with Alzheimer's do, in fact, have leaky gut. Very important thing to find out. Um, very important thing to address. Uh, so this is a, absolutely a contributor. Uh, microbiome, having the appropriate microbiome, these things are all important. And you mentioned CBD oil, CBD oil which, uh, as I say, we tend to use for people who are having trouble. Another big issue with sleep, of course, is waking up in the middle of the night. And for people who are ruminating, a very common problem, they often will do very well with some tryptophan. Sometimes, as you know, they are progesterone deficient, so another cause of it. Sometimes just uh, uh, anxiety from stress stress, all these things. And of course, there's the whole issue with people who have sleep apnea. So again, it's identical. Oh, you're still here with me? There, there we yeah. go. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the other things we were talking about a little bit here, Doc, is sort of this gut-brain connection. You know, what are some of the things you do? Obviously, the diet is so fantastic that you laid out here in your book here about, you know, really going through how to really take care of that microbiome, intestinal permeability, a.k.a. leaky gut. What are some of the right. other maybe foods or supplements that you recommend that really, if you can tell that there's a major connection there that you recommend as well? Absolutely. So we do try to evaluate. And by the way, the other microbiome that seems to be so critical in this disease is the rhinocinal microbiome. And if you actually look at the organisms present in the brain of Alzheimer's, what have people found? Herpes simplex here, P. gingivalis, oral bacteria, um, various molds and fungi that you're getting through your nose. So all these things are absolutely critical. So you're right. We tend to look, and there are a number of tests we like to use, for example, Cyrex-2. Uh, people like to use others. 
Um, and then if there is leaky gut, as there are, as there is in so many people, um, then what we typically like to do is either uh, to use something like colostrum. Some people like uh, colostrum. Some people like to use uh, like to use bone broth is another one. Um, slippery elm is actually another good one. Um, and again, anything possible to heal up that gut. And then, of course, as you indicated, critical for microbiome. And yes, there are all sorts of probiotics and prebiotics, but as you well know, you want to, if possible, get this through your food. So you want to have the various, uh, you know, kimchi and, and sauerkraut and things that are fermented along with things like jicama that provide the, the prebiotics. So yes, we want to heal the gut for these people. And then we want to make sure that it stays healed and we alter the microbiome positively. And as you know, uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry has come out with a, a book very recently that's, uh, that's, that goes into detail with this. Of course, David Perlmutter um, has done a tremendous amount of, of work on this, as have you and others. Great, great stuff. I love this. So, so let's hit on, I, I just want everybody to be completely aware, what are the biggest foods that people just have to get out of their diet that's just completely you know, causing havoc in the gut, on the brain, really yeah. driving this? Yeah, that's a really good point. So, uh, so there's a chapter in there about how to give yourself Alzheimer's. And so you can, it goes through, you know, the idea is, of course, not that you necessarily want to do that, but the idea is, uh, what are the things that you're already doing that are, in fact, contributing to your cognitive decline or to your future cognitive decline? And so we go through a whole day, what would you do? And in fact, you're absolutely right. Food is a critical, critical contributor. So number one, you want to give yourself Alzheimer's, start drinking sodas uh, as often as you like. Try to get as much sugar. Try to bump your, your insulin as quickly as possible. Um, what will happen is, you know, you'll, what actually happens is you phosphorylate your IRS1, which is an insulin receptor signaling molecule, such that you literally turn it off. You change from tyrosine phosphorylation, which is insulin sensitizing, to the three, to, to uh, serine and threonine phosphorylation. So you're switching the pattern. So you're literally turning this down. So you're not responding anymore. And of course, insulin is a critical molecule to support your synapses. So you're damaging your synapses by taking in this sugar. So number one is just the fact that we were not made to take in any more than about 15 grams of simple carbohydrates, if that, per day. That's a maximum. One Coca-Cola, for example, has 39 grams. So you're killing yourself with this, and you're definitely giving yourself cognitive decline. Number two, processed foods, as you know, huge, huge problems. Um, and then number three is looking at when you eat. So the common thing is we all get under stress. And so what do we do? We go to the refrigerator at 11 at night, um, start you know, having some food. Maybe we get a cupcake. Um, of course, we end up with gluten, which unfortunately for most of us is damaging to our diet. Start poking holes there. Then we go, what do we do? We stop and we pick up some French fries. French fries not only have horrible fats, as you know, but they have acrylamide. Acrylamide is a direct neurotoxin. So you want to damage your hippocampus. You want to give yourself Alzheimer's. Go have some fries and a Coke. And while you're at it, you know, get some CAFO-related uh, beef um, and uh, with a high omega-6. So that's another thing. High omega-6 to omega-3 level. Standard hamburger um, is one of the best things you can do. So now you've, you've made your gut leak. You've changed your, your insulin, your IRS-1 signaling. You've made it so that you now have driven up your omega-6s and made yourself very pro-inflammatory. You've really done pretty much everything you need to do to give yourself Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, you know, and, and you're painting a good picture here because, I mean, I'm thinking about the number of families and people that that is what they're eating on a daily basis. You know, my wife and Chelsea and I were just... And I just noticed this again last week because I just, when I'm out looking at restaurants, I just never even hardly see the fast food restaurants. And I said, hey, honey, you know, I said the thing, we were just driving down the strip. I said, it just amazes me that 90% of the restaurants that people are eating in right now are fast food. 90% probably. That's more. scary. I mean, it is just, you know, it's just. It's scary. Yeah, it, it's scary. And when, of course, when you're traveling, that's the easiest thing to do. You're traveling along. You don't know where to stop. You don't know whether something is going to be good or not. Maybe you use your Yelp 
But the reality is you need to find a way to stay away. And again, as, as is pointed out often, if you're doing 90 plus percent of the things right, then okay, maybe an occasional thing is not going to hurt you, occasionally stopping there. But you, obviously, as you start working this into a common diet, um, you're changing your microbiome. You're changing the leakiness of your gut. You're changing the leakiness of your blood-brain barrier. You're ch literally changing the signaling in your neurons to be pro-Alzheimer's. Now, let me ask this, just a few more questions. One, we talked about fish earlier. What are maybe, in, and am I correct in saying three of the best fish people could eat that are lower in mercury but higher in those fats are going to be, you know, a wild Alaskan salmon, uh, right. uh, mackerel, and sardines. Those are th three, three that you mentioned, correct? Absolutely. And then, and, and then mm -hmm. let's talk about the lectins. You know, I know one of the things, too, and in ketosis, you know, Obviously, um, you know, our ancestors for a period of time, some of them did eat some grains. Now, they were prepared completely differently than they are today. But talk to me about lectins and, you know, some of these issues with grains, especially the unsprouted grains. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and in fact, you know, again, when someone comes in with cognitive decline or when you're trying to prevent it, it is critical if you do not treat cognitive decline successfully, as you know, it's a terminal illness. Um, so this is a very, very serious matter. People are going to die if you don't pull out all the stops. So we argue that you know, this is an emergency. You want to do everything. You can always reintroduce things later, but you want to get rid of the gluten. You want to get rid of the dairy. And we recommend also to get rid of the grains. In KetoFlex 12.3, we try to stay away from these. Now, as you know, Le these are still controversial. How, how much should you be eating in terms of legumes? Um, these are all questionable. What should you be doing in terms of peanuts and things like this? What about the various beans and things like this? It's a good question. And so you, some people will do uh, food allergy testing to see where you stand. But no question, lectins have, have certainly been raised as, a, as an issue. So until you start to see improvement, we recommend to be relatively strict. Get on. There, there are so many great foods to eat, as you indicated. You know, there's the wild-caught salmon. Um, there are all sorts of incredible vegetables. Look, for example, and compare with uh, Terry Walls' uh, work in MS. She's had very good results. Uh, with large amounts of vegetables, large amounts of uh, sulfur vegetables, colorful vegetables, etc. Uh, so uh, we we actually uh, have a garden here that we use that that is that's a, a wonderful and provides all sorts of things. And again, uh, good fats and the appropriate uh, uh, extra virgin olive oil and things like this uh, can be wonderful and can replace these things. Uh, then, as, as Dr. Gunry has suggested, you can slowly reintroduce some of these things and see how you fare. If you don't have any sensitivity to gluten, and in fact, again, you can look at a Cyrex-3 or, or others, other antibodies to look to see whether you're specifically sensitive. Uh, but if you're not, you can reintroduce small amounts and see how you do. Yeah, you know, one of the things I love here in your book, again, Doc, is you did such a great job of going through, hey, here's some of the best. And, and one of the things, again, going through this, you have green light foods, which I love this, red, uh, yellow light foods and red light foods. In, in certain categories as well, really going through, hey, go for these foods, warning small amounts of these, and then stay completely away from these. And it's such a great way to really show people, hey, here are the best things you could be eating on a daily basis. I want to encourage everybody, check out this new book. It's the end of Alzheimer's. And listen, one, get it for yourself, but hey, pick up an extra copy. Get one for someone you love. You know, the amount of uh, people today in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are going to have parents with Alzheimer's is at an all-time high. And if they can start learning today what to start doing, the action steps they can start taking, it's going to make a big difference in their life uh, right now, it's going to make a big difference in their, in their life in the future. I know for myself, I've got my parents are, uh, uh, my mom's about 65, my dad's um, almost 68, and they live, they were retired from Ohio down to Florida years ago. And I'm always, you know, I mean, I, I've stocked their cabinets full of bone broth and other supplements. And, you know, uh, my mom makes bone broth every day. I joke around with my mom, I call her the Vitamix lady because, and I have no deal with Vitamix. She just, <laughs> she used to go to Costco. In fact, maybe she's picked up your book there, but she, um, you know, does her smoothies in the morning. But, you know, they eat really, really clean now. And the reason is, is I was just so proactive in making sure they did. 
you know, they took care of me when I was younger. I see I've got to take care of them now. So I want to encourage everybody, take care of yourself, your family, your parents. Get this book for them and start following the advice in here. And, you know, I love your advice on doing that um, moderate ketogenic diet, you know, really really that balanced diet to where, and you know, it's funny, we call it low carb today or ketogenic, but this is the way our ancestors ate is sort of this keto cycling where they were going in and out of ketosis on a regular basis, but they were there a lot of times. I mean, it's, 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 it's the diet that we were created for. Yeah. You're a good son, Josh. (laughs) Doing all those (laughs) great things. And you're absolutely right. This is, you know, this is about evolution. One of the things we're finding here is that we have defied evolution. We have assumed that it's fine to eat fries and to eat, drink Cokes and things like this, soft drinks and to do all these sorts of things. It's not. It, guess what? It turns out it's killing us. So, in fact, you're absolutely right. This, these, this is the diet that we evolved to eat. Yeah, g- great advice. All right, I want to just kind of break down for everybody here a few things. Number one, run out and get the book here today by Dr. Dale. He talked about, you know, foods you got to get out, get rid of the sodas and package and processed foods and the refined grains. That's number one. You know, be careful with the type of fish you're eating. Again, get more of those omega-3 fish. Only wild kappa eat them in moderate amounts. Some of the supplements, I know, Dr. Dale, you talked about uh, some favorites. You talked about the MCT oil being uh, so beneficial for the body. Uh, also talked about you know uh, omega threes, getting probiotics, ashwagandha, bacopa, um, you know, and many others. And again, you can all find these in the book. So again, you can find this book anywhere books are sold, both online or hey, go into Costco, go into uh, Barnes and Noble and check them out there. And where can we learn more about you, Doctor uh, Bresden? What where is uh, do you have a website we can all visit? Yes, yeah, so you can go to drbredesen.com. Dr. Bredesen, as you'll see it on here on his uh, new book here, again, New York Times bestselling book, five weeks in a row, very rare thing. And it's, it's, it's very rare because this book is so well written and so condensed into it's a lot of meat and potatoes. It's really, really amazing content backed by proven medical science for 28 years here, as Dr. Uh, Bresden was talking about. So, hey, want to say thanks so much for being a guest on the show today, Dr. Dale. Josh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Ain't no problem. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. Hey, if you've enjoyed this live video, make sure to share it with a friend, share it on Facebook. Have a great week.